just about R. I posted online last night um, a tutorial on the website, so you can find it. I lifted them and I printed them. To, uh, there's a MOOC, a massive online open course running right now on using R on Coursera, so this is great timing. Uh, you can definitely sign up for that uh, MOOC if you'd like and follow along. So I've, I've, the sky has posted all these videos on YouTube on how to install R, how to use it, so I'll post some of his videos periodically. There's no sense in me uh, making my own videos that do exactly the same thing. So here's the general idea. You go ahead and you install R first. So R, just the basic software, download it from their website and install it. You'll never use R, but you need it on your computer running in the background. The second piece of software you need to install is called R Studio. R Studio is when you're actually going to work. In the background, it will go call R and show the results to you. So it's the same similar idea to MATLAB. You've got MATLAB, and then you've got your editor where you type in your code. Similar idea, but not quite the same. R, you'll never open R. In fact, R Studio will open R for you. So let's take a look at what R Studio looks like. It's great. You're the first class that gets to use it. Previous years, they've used a, a different version. Um, I really like R Studio. One of my grad students, former grad students, told me about it. It's really cool. It's more smiling. I think it's an alternative. But this is such a good option to use that you can run with this instead. Our studio, you open it, it will look the same on Windows and Linux Mac. So it's a cross-platform piece of software. Up on the top left, you write your code, and you save that into the file. So here I call, call the file demo.r. Here at the bottom, it's R itself. So if you open just R on your computer, um, so again, you've got it installed, it doesn't mean that you would never have to use it. But if you did open R by itself, it would look like what's shown here in the bottom on the left hand side. So it looks kind of like MATLAB, you've got the standard command line, you can go type in commands, etc. to get, get answers. Here it shows a bit of your workspace, so it shows your variables that you've got, you can go inspect them, see what, they, uh, what sizes they are. And then here on the bottom left, it, uh, bottom right, it accumulates all your plots. This is the nice feature about R. The regular R, Sorry, the nice feature about R Studio. The regular R will throw up your plots in different windows and you get this clustered uh, mess on your desktop. This one cre creates a single unified window and you can cycle with these arrows backwards and forwards through all the plots. You can go see um, the file inspector on your computer and a bit of integrated help. So here's the, here's the approach you take for the, for the main assignment. You write your code up here. And then you can interactively test it. So, for example, I'm writing a line of code. This button up here says run the current line or selection. So I can click on that and it will retype that for me down here. Or I can just use that shortcut key. Um, it will be the shortcut key for Windows and Linux. So essentially, if I push that button, it evaluates the command that I've highlighted. That way, I don't have to copy and paste lines up and down. So I'm at the top of keeping a record of the work I've done. I'm saving that to my hard drive periodically, clicking on the save icon up there. And then I can run this line by line. Or if I've got, got things down to a working state, I can run the entire script from beginning to end by clicking on that source button. And then if I, it's done several things here, but um, if I click on that source button there, I can run, run it and it will execute all the lines in that file. So you're, you're comfortable with um, MATLAB and those tools, so I won't go through some of these commands that are obvious, like uh, on, uh, multiplication division and, and order of expressions being evaluated. 
Um, R has its concept of vectors. It uses the C function for combine. So combine one, two, three, four, and then you'll get a vector of that um, down here. Um, or I can just use the sequence operator, one colon four. <coughs> or the sequence function. All of these will do, do the same thing for you. Create a sequence of four numbers. Or if I want to create a sequence going from two, ending at eight in steps of, of two. So that's, um, that's standard, you would expect that from MATLAB. You, one thing that people get confused with in R relative to MATLAB is the concept of the assignment operator. So in MATLAB we're used to saying x is equal to 2. In R you tend to use x arrow 2. So x less than sign minus 2. So you assign the value of 2 to this variable y. That's the more correct way of doing it. You can write in R x equals 2. It is perfectly correct. x equals 2 down here works just as fine, but the, the better way is to say assign the value of 2 to x. The reason is that that is a formal assignment of x. This is used in function evaluation. So in a function, this is very different from MATLAB and far more powerful than MATLAB in terms of how functions are structured. In R, I would write a function, say um, f, and the function gets named arguments. So I, can, I write x equals 2, comma, y equals 4. That's telling me in the function there's going to be a variable x and it needs to get the value of 2. If there's a variable y in the function, it's going to receive the value of 4. Whereas in MATLAB, you're used to writing f to the common 4, and you have to tell MATLAB that the sequence of the variable being assigned is 2 belongs to x, y belongs to 4. But in R, you do that up in the function definition. So the equal sign is intended for this purpose and not to assign variables two functions. So it's intended to tell, tell R, I would like the value of 2 to be um, associated with x inside the function, and then you write the function further on, which uses those x and y values. So there's a slight, slight difference there. Um, the most important part that you need for now to uh, solve the first assignment is to learn how to read data into the software. So I'm just going to move this across here. You can read data directly from the course uh, website. So the, 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 the form, uh, the place where all the data sets are, datasets.connectedme.com slash datasets. All the data sets for the course I'll store over here. So if you go through them, um, you, you can see there's, there's about 30 odd data sets. It gives a brief description and shows you the dimensions of the data. But here it gives you the download link for it. So for example, if I went to this data set that which was later on on batch fields. Uh, you click on that link, it gives you more detailed description about the data um, and so forth. Here's the part that you need to use for R. See the link over here, the CSV file, you can click on it and save it to your hard drive. That's one option. So I can right click, save it to my hard drive somewhere, or I can right click on it and say copy link address. Okay, so that's going to get me the link directly to the CSV file. That link looks as follows. All the links will be datasets or connecting your com slash files slash the dataset name.csv. So I, once I have that link, I can just use it directly in R Studio with this command. Um, so I say read.csv and I just give it the link. And R will, let's go assign it to a variable, let's call that batch. <coughs> so this is the batch dataset as it's read from the website read.csv goes to the internet, pulls the data file from my server, and assigns it to the variable batch.web. So there's the variable, it's uh, two, just a single column of numbers with the yield of, of this batch reactor. So I can read data sets directly from the internet if I've got an internet connection, or I can save the CSV file to my hard drive and give it the file name on my hard drive. Windows users still always use the, the slash that goes that way, forward slash. Even Windows, you're used to using these slashes, but in R, you would just change that slash to this, this slash. Windows Linux users give the full path to the file using the impact of the other notation. So either way, you'll read the CSV file, load and read. Then you can do interesting things with it, like um, plot. Uh, so here I can get a summary, I can get that five number summary we spoke about earlier. So summary of that, that uh, data set. 
gives me the minimum, first quartile medium, third quartile maximum. I can go by histograms from it, I can go by box plots from it, and so forth. So all of that is described in the tutorial for you um, in that, uh, those 13, 15 steps up here. So the first, the first we're on reading data into our basic manipulation, plotting various simple plots, um, histograms, adding grid lines, arrows, if you want to identify interesting features or outliers in your data set, how to show those on your plots. Um, then these ones start to go into the second and third assignments. So really you should be following up to about step um, 8, 9, 10, um, maybe even 11 for this first assignment. So this is self-directed on your own uh, learning the software. However, if you get stuck at any point, email myself or the TAs. Probably email myself. The TAs haven't used R too much. I'm, I'm, I've been using quite a bit, so I can probably help you get that stuff out of it. Got any issues? Any questions about the software <coughs> so far? Yes, sure. So the um, basic R Studio will load a workspace if it sees it. It may ask you to save the workspace on exit. It's up to you. You can uh, do that. By default, the working directory is your root home directory. So you can change that to maybe if you've got your force and free work in a specific folder on your computer, you can change your home directory to that. But it's always your option. And what do Okay, good question. Do we need R code for assignments? It certainly helps. Um, when it comes to the course project, I tend to just look over the, the source code if I'm failing to see the steps that you've taken. You may not have described it by clearly in your writer, but if I look at the source code, I can clearly see the steps that you've taken. So it definitely does assist the TAs. Myself, a great process, but not, not a requirement. Periodically for the online testing, I will in future tests, there'll be a, a block that you can attach any comments to any question you write. Maybe you want to add some of your thoughts that you had while you were writing that answer. Um, you may want to paste some code in there, for example, so that could be a space to do that as well. In the future testing software, next week will be back, but there will also be the ability to upload images. So if you done any rough notes on paper, you can take a photo of your cell phone, upload it like that, and I can see any rough calculations um, that you've done to get to your answer, if you feel that will be helpful for the grade. Okay, so screenshots of the software, etc., would be helpful. Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look then at the material for today's class. So we're beginning at the second section of the course, and here the key thing, to recognize about this, and I will spend some time talking a bit about what variability is and why it's important to this course. We'll look then at some basics of histograms and probability. These are topics you're very comfortable with from your prerequisites of the course and stats. Uh, you've seen the normal distribution, you've been introduced to the T distribution, and those are the two main ones we'll spend time on. But I will introduce one or two of the others. 600 level students you'll be expected to go look at the Poisson distribution and the high square distribution at the time. We'll spend some time on the central limit theorem. Despite me not wanting to go into theory too much in this course and more of the practical aspects, understanding the central limit theorem, understanding the concept of independence are two crucial concepts from stats that we'll use throughout this course. And so I will go through those in about a class or two and spend some time recapping that. Then we'll move on to um, test the differences. We have called the hypothesis tests. As I've mentioned in the introduction, I'll throw out that term. I don't like to use hypothesis tests. They're meaningless. We'll look at it from, from a confidence interval. And then we'll look at pair tests as well. So here's how you would use this material. Um, I said in the first visualization section, you would perhaps, when you start working, you would collect a, a set of data which is listing for you the yields from the batch reactor for the past three years. So you've got about a thousand odd data points. What do I do with this? Well, one of the things we want to find is what is the distribution of that data? That's important to understand. So understanding whether data are normally distributed or whether they have, say, a chi-squared distribution, 
help us understand the nature of the process we're dealing with. What are we likely to expect from day-to-day -day operation? If I get a yield suddenly that's now 160 grams per liter, what are the chances of that occurring? Is this within the realm of normal probability? Is this really an exceptional batch? The reason why that's important is if your boss tells you, Kevin, go and investigate what happened, if you can counteract and say, well, you know what, this is likely to happen in five out of 10 batches. Really, there's no point in spending time and money on this to investigate something that can happen quite regularly. It's important to be able to justify it and back up your, your response over there. Or you might want to say, well, look, the chances of this happening are extremely exceptional. Yes, it probably is worth figuring out what caused this so we don't, um, don't have this in the future. This is interesting and important from a maintenance perspective. What is the probability that we have come to a fail this month? We, we know from 4N that the concept of reliability can, can impact the plant's operation. Uh, what are the probabilities we're dealing with? How frequently can we schedule maintenance to avoid these catastrophic events from occurring simultaneously? So we get a handle on understanding those failures. Very important here, companies offer <coughs> multiple reactors that are identical in, in pretty much every respect, but producing different quality products. Can we judge whether this reactor really does have a different quality product versus the other from a statistical data point of view? Operators will say this reactor always gives me better product or generally gives me better product. But can we judge from a data analysis point of view which one really does and does not and despite the fact that this question might seem like why the heck is someone asking about the confidence interval for a certain variable, the confidence interval carries a great deal of information with it. So it gives a lot of helpful side information. Uh, it gives a measure of central tendency, it gives a measure of spread. So there are helpful ways of talking about variables. So, so we need to be comfortable with, with talking about confidence intervals. We've seen those coming up in the regression sections of the class as well. If you need a bit more, um, go back to your undergrad, uh, your second year, third year stats and course notes, or I highly recommend chapter two from Box Hunter and Hunter for some basic recap of what this material is in this section. That's a very applied way of looking at it. It's the general approach of all of this section. <coughs> concepts, I won't go through these. Keep this as a checklist for yourself to come back to in four or five classes from now to make sure that you can understand and describe to your colleague what every single one of these is. So can you tell the person next to you what the central limit theory is and why it's important? Can you explain what it is for something to have a normal distribution or what an outlier is? So make sure that these are, these are concrete in your mind. Um, these are important for the rest of this section and for the rest of the classes afterwards. Okay, so if it weren't for variability, I wouldn't be um, doing any research or into data analysis. If it weren't for variability, probably, pretty much, I would say, as chemical engineers, we'd have little opportunity for careers. We're, keep, we're remaining employed because our chemical processes and the systems we deal with do not operate at constant flat lines. We would love it. If I could build a petroleum refinery and it could produce product at exactly the target I would like with no or minimal variation, I could set it and forget it. It would be like a robotic factory. I could turn the lights off in that dystopian world of robots working for us and we're sitting back at the beach. That's never going to happen. Okay? We rely on the fact that our processes are always got some variability built in. We're comfortable with that concept in our day-to-day -day lives. This being close to the new year, we may have made the resolution to lose weight. And we all know when we step on that scale every morning, it's a different number every time, but there's a central value that it tends to be plus or minus or not. So if we're comfortable with this concept of variability in our day-to-day -day lives, then we don't have that consistency. So this, might, this is more likely what we'll see. Even this is extremely idealistic. This is a process that's operating at roughly the central line here, 1680. Um, this is that board thickness data set that I mentioned earlier. So we've got a process operating at that central point 
with some variation above and below it. And we cannot account for the variation. It's due to measurement error. It's due to all sorts of reasons that we, we covered in our measurement course, calibration offsets in our data, changes that occur that we cannot explain from a physical first principles point of view. So as engineers, we say, well, I'm not going to try and even explain that. I'm just going to just lump it into this bigger term called E error. So we'll see this in, in our regression. We'll see this in data analysis all the time. Just call it E. Just dump it into error. And what we want to understand is whether that error really is just error or if it still contains something that we, that's systematic that we can explain. This is far more likely what you will see. If you go to a data historian, so uh, many of you, when you start to work, your company that you work for will likely have invested money a few years ago in a data historian. So they go by many names, but essentially they're, they're glorified databases that companies record their data in and never look at again. Unfortunately. So as uh, John McGregor calls it, it's a data graveyard. So companies collect this data, dump it in there, and they will only ever look at it if the government comes knocking on their door and says, well, you killed people five years ago with your drug. What did you do? What did you manufacture at that particular date and time? And then the companies go, oh shit, let's go take a look and see what's happened. But you can be far more proactive about it. And that's what this course is about. Let's learn how we can take our data from these systems and use it. So what you're likely to see if you go, you freshly graduate, you're feeling adventurous and you say, I'm going to apply what Kevin taught me in 4C, 6C, and let's take a look at it. This is something that you're going to see. There'll be drifts. So here the process has drifted and then come back down below its target. And it's slowly moving, there's a slight excursion here, another larger drift, and it's and it went up over time. So it moves around in a, in a, in a manner that is sort of, sort of like a wandering walk. We call this um, a random walk. So the kind of movement that a drunk person walking along the sidewalk um, has on any given day that you're drinking. So this is, this is a random walk, typical process. And even this is fairly idealistic. This does not contain many of the realities you see in the process. What you will see more likely is something that looks as follows. You'll see periods of time where you just record a flat line. Or sometimes that's just totally missing. There's a gap in your data. You'll see these spikes. Something happened in your process that shot it up and then it's maybe the feedback control system has brought the process back to the target point. So, so our feedback control loops will create variability for us. That's an important point to understand. Variability is introduced often by the systems we put on to keep the system in control. So a process control loop will often introduce variability into our system for us. Equipment may break down, there may be shutdown of maintenance, recalibration, the environment around us is changing. So the ambient temperature and pressure, that would be what likely causes something that looks like this. Whenever you have a slow moving disturbance in your process, often due to something that's changing at the same rate. So a slow moving disturbance is moving due to a slow moving external impact in fact, like the temperature outside. It doesn't change very rapidly, so we see those changes occurring at the same place, in the same pace in our data. Another place that could occur is if you're coming back to a refinery example, you get one tank of material from Saudi Arabia, the next day you're getting a tank from, say, Mexico, the Gulf. You may find that as you switch your process from one raw material source over to the other, your process needs to accommodate and adjust to new operating points based on this change coming in. So our raw materials we feed to the process will cause changeovers and shifts in our data set. So very hard to find steady state. Okay, so this concept that we've learned in second year, third year, fourth year to model processes that relies on the steady state assumption, we pretty much cannot find steady state in real data sets. Incredibly hard to find steady states. So data sets that I've looked at from Petro Canada or uh, this lumber example, I'll have two, three years of data and you look at it and it's like, when is the process ever steady? What is the norm? And there is almost no normal operating point. 
So we have to become used to that in, real, in actual data sets. But that's what keeps us, uh, keeps us employed, is, is figuring out why our processes are doing it and trying to counteract it. So here's, here's my assertion why this section of the course is important. It's important because if you have variability in your product, you're defeating two important factors that your customers want. Your customers want uniformity and they want low cost. So if I'm buying a product, so me as the customer, I may go to the grocery store, I'm buying a product, I generally have two things in mind. High quality, uniform quality at the very least, and low cost. That's true of chemical companies as well, purchasing raw materials from other suppliers. If you have variability in your process, you're defeating both of those objectives in the following way. One is, your customer may not be able to use that product at all. So if I go to the grocery store, and for some reason, the batch of material I bought, say fresh milk, I think it's fresh milk, and it's not, I'm not able to use that product. So somehow, the company is messed up, and they've shipped you product that you're just not able to use. The viscosity is too high. I cannot put this polymer through my extruder, or I use an oil that causes the pump to fail totally. You put diesel in your petrol engine pump. So all of these things, that's your own mistake. That's not the company's mistake. But in general, these variability sources at the extreme can lead to, can lead to strong failure. Or it could just lead to your customer that you're that purchasing the product to have to put in far more energy than they normally would. So if I ship a product that now has a higher melting point, I have to now put in more energy into my extruder before I can make a workable product on my end. Or it might mean that I need to use longer reaction times to get to the final goal that I want. So by shipping me a poor product that's highly variable, I have to put more time and energy into it. And some other extreme examples are, I can really uh, dis destroy the value of my brand, so the intangible effect of my brand being used. So a few years ago, Maple Leaf shipped uh, packages of meat products with, uh, with this bacteria, this neuriosis in it, causing an outbreak. Several people died, and it caused somewhat a diminishing effect in their brand. Maybe you're not as in your memory if you weren't um, purchasing food or reading the media at that time. But to this day, I still I look at maple leaf foods in the grocery store and I'm like, hmm, should I or shouldn't I? Um, Toyota, sorry? More than Excel foods? <laughs> well, I don't know Excel foods reputation. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Toyota had an issue a few years ago where there, where there was claims that the uh, cars would suddenly accelerate. Okay, so they looked into that, and actually in many cases it's turned out that what happened is that the, passenger, uh, the driver in a moment of panic hit both the brake and the accelerator at the same time. So passenger, the drivers were claiming that they were braking, but the car was accelerating. Well, they were actually had a big boots on or something, that they were hitting both the pedals at the same time. But that issue is still ongoing. I think they actually did a thorough evaluation of the source code in the car and looking at that. Uh, so I don't think that issue is resolved. But you can see how a poor product can lead to can lead to a, a reputation that's that's broken, or it can at the very least lead to the consumer of that product having to put more time and energy into what they would normally have. So very quickly they can switch to other suppliers of this of this material that you have been purchasing. So that's that's low uniformity. Let's look at the at the costing. Uh, costing, if I'm producing a product that's highly variable, so me as the supplier, if I know that there's high degree of variation in my product, I will have to probably inspect that product. So pharmaceutical companies do this all the time. They have things in their company or procedures in their company for 100% inspection. And it is exactly what it says it is. They inspect their products manually 100%. So every single thing that comes out the door is manually inspected or inspected in some way. You can see how that tremendous amount of cost that's built in there. If I'm producing a product on the other hand that I know has low variability and is consistent, I do not need to inspect every single thing leaving my shipping dock. I can inspect some subset of it. So I can reduce the costs on my side 
by producing a low variability product. There's our even, even inspection campaigns that are called 200% inspection in that industry. So this is, is quite common in, in industries, is to inspect heavily to try and screen out the defective product. But it's a very, very expensive technique to do it. The other problem is that if I'm producing off-spec product and I'm fortunate enough to identify it before I ship it to my customer, what do I do with that? Well, I have to throw it out, sell it at reduced prices, on a sale perhaps, or I have to rework it. So polymers could maybe be reworked and, and recycled internally in my company. But still, it's costing me money to do this. So let's come back to this assertion here. Customers want uniformity and low cost. If I've got high variability in my product, I'm giving them a product that's going to cost them money or it's going to cost me money. But either way, I'm not being efficient here. Here's another one to see um, if I'm receiving a product with high degree of variability, so raw materials, and I have this coming into my process, my process has no feedback control, which is actually true for many, many processes. We have systems that often just run, the material runs in and runs out again. There's very little correction for the variation that comes in. So it's clear that if I've got a, a data point out here on the histogram, it's going to come through my process and come out here on the histogram. So low variability, high variability in leads to high variability out. Okay, that, that's, that's clear. On a system where I'm not counteracting for it, whatever I put in is going to come out again. So what's feedback control? One way to do feedback control is essentially a mechanism where we're introducing variability into our process, artificially introduced variability, to counteract this variability. So that at the end, I get something out that's more desirable. That's all that feedback control is. So you're comfortable with those block diagrams from 3P or 4E, where you've got your process here, GP, you're measuring Y, the feedback, Compare it to your set point, put it into your control system, GC, and you put a manipulated variable U into your process. So you're comfortable with this notation. Well, here's my process. Here's my manipulated variable. That's this guy here. I'm introducing variability into my process with U so that I get Y that's closer to set point. All that feedback control is a mechanism to add variability to process. But this is important to understand. If I got a raw material that was not so variable, I would need to put in less energy here. This implies energy. This is a cost. Feedback control is always costing me something. I have to change my process behavior. I have to add in more steam. I have to add in more energy to adjust and compensate for this variability up here. So we would like, if possible, to have our inputs with low variability that means that we can provide outputs with low variability and less cost. Okay, so hopefully that has convinced you of the importance of variability. Now let me convince you on why this is important for the rest of this course. Well, firstly, the class that we looked at prior to this was on showing variability. There's no sense in showing plots with straight lines, right? So we we're looking at showing variability. This class, this section is on quantifying variables. So what's the mean? What's the standard deviation? What's the spread? Can we quantify numerically that variability in some way? And then the second half, when we're doing confidence tests or what you call hypothesis tests, can we compare variability from one system to the other? To do that, we first need to quantify it, then we can compare it. So this, the next two, two, three, four classes is on that topic. The, class, the section after that is on monitoring charts to track variability in our process. Can we monitor our process to see where the variability is? Can we react to that? Can we see variability coming in? I can stop or slow things down to fix up the problem before it leads to a problem on my customers. Can I track the variability in my process? The fourth section on regression analysis is relating variability in one variable to another. So creating that link between two variables. And then section five, the section on design experiments, we're actually adding variability into our process so that we learn more about it and that we can optimize our process. This is why I said earlier, 
you will probably not be able to run experiments in your process too easily in practice. Because no one, especially your boss, wants to sanction or allow you to add variability to a process. They're like, oh no, you can't do that. that is, that's not allowed, okay? So artificially adding variation to process is something that's not typically allowed. But when we do get permission or we're allowed to do it, we want to make sure we can do that in a sensible way that we can uncover the most information in the shortest amount of time. And then if we have a bit of time at the end, I'd like to talk about multivariate data analysis, which is obviously on multiple variables and extracting data variables. Okay, so let's, uh, with that out of the way, let's take a look at some of the details here. Histograms. Histograms are a way to summarize variables, variability, and we have that in, in two cases. The first case is for a categorical variable. So a categorical variable, here I'm showing, for example, the number of children born and their gender. So male, female, and that's my category, and then the number on the vertical y-axis. So typically shown with the bar plots. And you can think of many instances where we've got multiple categories. So one is typically uh, is education. So high school, university, graduate studies, etc. So you've got three categories there. Religion, a multi-category, uh, race, uh, country of origin, region of origin, all of these are categorical variables. And we'd like to summarize that by category. So that vertical number means something to us in, in the context that we're talking about the category. More often though, and this is something you're comfortable with obviously, is the horizontal axis being continuous. So here in this company, for example, they're producing a product and they're writing on the package, so they're shipping a package of food or a package of juice or whatever it is, that there's one kilogram of product in there. So a thousand grams. But if we go look at the production records from the company for the past month, we may see that well, no, we're not filling that to one kilogram. We're probably, uh, well, not probably, we are overfilling and we're targeting about 1,100 grams. So instead of shipping 1,000 grams, I'm shipping 1,100. And the reason I'm doing that is because government regulations mandate that a certain percentage must meet or exceed the labeling requirement. So that small tail over there is the minimum allowable that I can ship the maximum that I can ship to my customers that don't need the requirement. I have to overfill and waste because my system that's filling the bags is not capable of meeting that one kilogram target with a high degree of accuracy. I've got a great amount of spread. Okay. Now, if you as an engineer can figure out how to reduce that histogram and shrink it in, so quantifying that spread is important firstly. What's your baseline? What is my degree of spread? If I can figure out a way to engineer the system that can bring that spread in, now I can shift that histogram down to the thousand rep and still meet the government requirements okay? and get a promotion. Because this is a big thing. If all companies fill packaged goods, the biggest issue is overfill and the waste that goes with it. Histograms are a great way to quantify what that level of overfill is. Okay, so if you think about these examples, uh, quickly write down on your, on your page in front of you or talk with the person next to you, what would the histogram look like for numbers thrown from a six-sided guy? What would the histogram look like for, if I went to the physics lab here on campus and got all the lab reports for the students where they were doing that lab experiment that you all do in the first year when you measure the value of G, what would the values of G look like from all those lab reports? What would the histogram look like for this the class test here with it's really easy? What would the histogram look like for all the income reported on the tax returns for people who file tax returns in Canada? What would the histogram look like for the number of bacteria per square per cubic inch from a sample of meat that I go and take from the daily account? So think of those um, four or five cases for a few uh, minutes and then we'll compare what the histograms might be.
uh, like the number of dies. I'm, I cannot take unlimited throws. I'm taking a sample of throws, and I'm going to get an estimate of what the population is doing. Bacteria counts. I can't measure every possible uh, daily meat sample. I can only take a subset of that. What would the bacterial count look like? Normal distribution. Would there be a balance somewhere? Yeah. Let's hope the government sets some limits. Let's say that limit is there. Then would it look like an income distribution? Would it be like this? <laughs> let's hope not. <laughs> and let's hope the company's got some bacterial level and then cutting it down. So most of your daily meat packages have zero or close to zero, and then very few have and none or little exceed the limit. Okay. So the key here, as I said in the next slide, is there's a time scale idea that's happening here. Histograms show long-term probabilities for us. Um, I cannot predict from the histogram, however, of any of these histograms, what the next value is going to be. So if I throw my dice, the next throw, I cannot tell it. it's going to be a three. Okay. For G, if I measure, if I pick the next random lab report, I cannot tell what the student's value is. But I'm pretty sure if I see a value of 12 in their report, that there's something wrong in their work. Because the distribution doesn't accommodate for that large outlier. Grades, I cannot tell what, what uh, anyone's grade is going to be, predict what it's going to be. However, I can make a prediction of where I should expect it to be located for the vast majority of cases. Similarly for income, um, stopping someone on the streets, I cannot anticipate what their income value is, but I could make a guess based on the region of where they live. So the government publishes this information by city, and so I can say, well, in Hamilton, the median income is $30,000, so I can make an estimate of what some of them is. Similarly, if your boss says, well, you know, the yield today on the reactor was 140 grams per liter, well, it's within the normal range of what we've seen in the past. If someone is pregnant without doing a test, I would have a 50-50 chance of guessing, right? But not quite 50-50, because in Canada, the sex ratio at birth is slightly skewed towards the male, but very, very, very minor compared to some other places in the world. I cannot predict how long someone is going to live, but based on statistics, I know that all the females <coughs> in this class would have 98.86% chance of reaching age 30 and that 77% of you would reach age 75. But I cannot tell whether you're going to die tomorrow or you're going to die at age 80 or 90 or whatever it is. Right? So clear thing with histograms is they give you an idea of global performance on past data, but we cannot tell anything about what's going to happen next. So we're going to look at the next class is how we want to find this.